Um, listen, I'm just going to say a, a few words, Dom, if you can let anybody um, in um, as, I'm, as, I'm, as I'm talking. Oh, we've got Mag as well. Okay, good. Perfect. We do have our speakers here, so no reason to worry. Um, so just for the sake of anyone joining us afterwards then, um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Barry Cranford. Uh, I'm the founder of the London Java community. Um, I'm not a developer myself. I run a tech recruitment company called RecWorks. Um, so at RecWorks, we have been on a mission for the last 12 years to prove that uh, recruitment can be used as a force for good in the industry. Um, and that's with a strong focus around learning, career development, mentoring, and that kind of thing. Um, put simply, if, if people want to learn and people are happy to teach or share, then we're happy to make the connections. And that can be on a group basis, like, like today, um, or on a one-to-one -one level, uh, which we do through our Meet and Mentor community. Um, so if anybody's interested in finding a mentor or uh, in helping out others, students, CTOs, aspiring speakers, like today, um, then feel free to, to sign up. Um, so quick reminder, it's all powered by recruitment, revenue that comes from recruitment. So if you're looking for anybody, then come and find us, uh, LinkedIn or Twitter or however you want to. Um, so on to today. Uh, so this is part of our Aspiring Speakers uh, initiative. Uh, so as part of that, we run lightning talks, which are five to seven minute talks that we run every two weeks. Um, both Anthony and Mag gave a lightning talk and wanted to take it uh, a step further. Uh, so we created this event called Short Talks, which we probably need to work on a slightly better title for. Um, but this is basically just a step up from, from a lightning talk to, to the next talk uh, on a journey to, to go to full conference speakers. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, then uh, obviously come and talk to us. Um, but as for today, we have Mag and Anthony. Um, Mag, are you okay to go first on this one? Yes, I am. That's you are? exciting. <laughs> I was just going to... Are you okay, good? I'll if you're, you. if, yes, if you're you. good, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll hand Why you Why not? I was um, going to have a margarita, but I'll do the talk instead. <laughs> well, I hope everyone enjoys. Good luck, Mag. Good luck, Anthony. I'll, uh, yeah, best of luck. Uh, cool. I think you might need to enable screen sharing. Great. So let's get started. Right, welcome everybody to the surprise first speaker of the day. <laughs> so can you hear me all okay? Give me a thumbs up. Great, okay. So we're gonna be having a chat about um, AI for the people, built by the people. Um, how do we diversify our teams so we can build better products for the world we live in today? So I'm going to introduce you to myself. Um, I'm going to give you a definition of AI and I'm open to your definitions. I'm gonna talk about some failures that have occurred within the space of AI. Um, I'd like to get us all talking about what a diverse team means um, and think about that in relation to building better products, products that are more robust, that include people on a better level than they do now. And then I wanna talk about the potential of AI and our role within AI, all of us who are here today. And then we'll have a Q&A and have a chat about things. So, this is Rosie the Riveter. As you can see, I was impersonating her uh, previously. And um, I came downstairs with a headband on and my flatmate said that I looked like Rosie the Riveter. I didn't know about her, so I did some research. And she was part of a poster campaign to get women in the workplace during the Second World War when the workforce had been depleted by enlisting. So um, basically Rosie has uh, promoted the financial independence of women through her poster in the US in the 1940s. So she is positively telling us that we can do it and yes, we can. So let's talk about how we can do that. So my name is Mag Leahy, and I'm an Irish lass from the countryside of Ireland. Um, I was born in County Cork by the sea, and I grew up between Cork and Kerry. Um, I've been in technology as a coder for over 20 years now, um, mainly in the front end of things. 
And during that time, I've worked um, with a lot of diverse technologies and diverse teams, not as diverse as I'd like though, and in different industries. Um, I'm a massive dog lover, and there will be a question at the end, which is to decipher the five breeds which make up my dog. This is Lassie, the hairy, scruffy beast on the right-hand side, and we were united about 13 years ago from Battersea Dogs Home. So we're both, um, you know, nature-loving, scruffy ladies. Um, speaking of that, I got some lovely feedback from my first talk, which was that it might be useful to wear a headset. Um, there was no complaints over my um, auditory powers or background noise, but uh, they thought it might be a nice idea. But just to note to everyone, I am wearing a headset. Um, it's a secret, but it is there. So um, I have a growth mindset, which means that I'm open to learning and I'm open to improving. And I would be open to hearing from you about any resources you have or anything you've learned on this topic. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, so feel free to link in with me. You should be able to find me quite easily. So what do I want today from this talk? So I'd like each of us to become more aware of bias and create products that are better. So this involves us looking around at our teams, whether they be on Zoom or uh, at some point in the future, hopefully physically together and think about how are we representing human characteristics within those teams because as a white woman from Ireland there is a lot that I don't know about. I don't know about how to build an airplane even though I've um, masqueraded as Rosie the Riveter briefly. I don't know what it feels like to be a person of colour working in tech in London. I know what it feels like as a white woman to be working in London. I don't know what it feels like to, I didn't know rather what it felt like to travel around London on crutches until I twisted my ankle really badly. And that is a small character trait that changed and it gave me a completely different view of things. So that was quite interesting. So I want us to see if we all look alike in our characteristics, then we're not going to be creating robust products. So it's just an awareness and a request to speak up about that. So AI, there's a lovely friendly looking robot, very shiny as well, is the simulation of human intelligence processes by machines. And um, I don't know, Barry, is there a chat enabled for this talk? There is, yeah, absolutely. There is, cool. Yeah, if you so just if press anybody the chat would like, at the bottom. great, to, um, to put in some more definitions, I'm happy to hear of those. Um, so let's see. So we've had failures in the past um, with AI. We've had, um, it's coming in more and more into our life. I feel like most of us will probably have used AI already today to check the weather, to um, play some music, to maybe order something online. We're being influenced by it all the time. And if we're not influencing it fairly, then we are not doing a good job. So some fails that I have uh, noted in this talk are digital, digital assistants. So if we think about Siri, Cortana and Alexa, we can think about um, AI that is um, basically mimicking female um, servile uh, roles. And this is gender bias and it's reinforcing um, something unfairly. Um, and also those digital assistants are not fairly responding in the way we would like them to as a role model to different scenarios that they're placed within. Um, facial recognition, um, as we know, I don't know if you do know actually, but facial recognition is vastly biased towards accurately recognizing white faces. And that could be due to the fact that a lot of white people have built the software and fed the software with data for these recognitions. If we have a um, diverse team, then of course we're going to be thinking of our teammates, we're going to be caring about the success for this um, tool on their faces, the impact um, of the tool on their lives. It gets more serious um, beyond you know, mislabeling someone in a photo or not recognizing a human face as a human face 
when law enforcement start using facial recognition and it is not successfully accurate at identifying people because of their ethnicity background. This is not just um, an oversight, it's, um, it's dangerous. Health, um, we've had um, Apple uh, Health Kit, which was released completely ignoring half the population, the 50%-ish of women who exist by not dealing with menstrual cycles and fertility. And I mean, fertility is pretty important to the human race. Um, so it's kind of a bit shocking, like, and you can imagine if the team is diverse in terms of gender, that would not have gone to market. Um, so there are ways that we can avoid embarrassment, we can um, honor people's human characteristics, and we can build better products by just being aware of diversity within teams. So uh, Dominique, thank you very much for setting up the survey. I just was curious about who we are today in terms of gender, ethnicity, and physical challenge. I just mentioned earlier about being on crutches. Um, have we experienced that? So if uh, Dom, you can pop up the surveys and people can um, have a, a little response into that, that would be great. Right, so we can see there that um, we have 57% of males, 29% females, and 14 who prefer not to say. So already you can see that there is not an equality in gender, so that's great. If we can go on to the next poll, please, Dom. So ethnicity. Uh, what, how would you describe your ethnicity? Okay, and there again, um, we can see that we basically have a split between Asian, white, and prefer not to say, but white being 56 again. So. That's pretty similar to the gender one, actually, interestingly. And then finally, the last poll is um, just to do with, have you ever experienced using crutches to assist you walking in the city? Okay. So that is, I didn't know how that would turn out, but it's um, just on those three human characteristics, that is quite telling. And that is me saying, please be aware of this. This is a, a group having a lunchtime conversation. We're not diverse enough. Um, so it's, it's an interesting um, state to be in. So we have mainly male, mainly white, and people who haven't um, experienced walking with crutches in the city. And they're just three characteristics and it's not an attack on anyone, it's just interesting. So um, I can't seem to get rid of the polls now, sorry about that, because my mouse disappeared. So, we, so we're talking about team diversity. A diverse team is a team that has a range of characteristics represented. So with regard to, but not limited to, ethnicity, gender, language, physical ability, and sexual orientation. Siri, what is the fastest route home? Now, if we think about this, um, it seems like it's a pretty straightforward answer. Um, you know, Maybe you want to take the train, maybe you want to take an Uber. Is Siri considering safety? Is it considering um, how safe I will be because of a human characteristic that I may have? Like, personally, as a woman at night, I would like to know that I'm traveling home in a, by a safe means. Um, how many are in my party? Is Siri considering this when it deciphers what's the fastest route home? Is it considering that I'm a cyclist? That the weather could affect my safety on the way home. Um, 
by having diverse teams, by having a cyclist and someone who may basically use a wheelchair for getting around, um, by considering um, all of these traits, we get we get more robust solutions. So Siri might be quite kind of conversational with us on this simple response. So it could be a windy day. It could say it's a bit dangerous to cycle home. So I've suggested the train. The trains are running fine. There we go. Alexa, play some motivating music. Now this is very much open to interpretation. What does motivating music mean? And is it considering my human characteristics? Is it considering the languages that I speak and the languages that I speak in order of my proficiency? Is it considering my ethnicity? Maybe I actually do want to listen to Irish traditional music all day. Maybe I don't, probably the second, but it's pretty good. Um, is it considering, is it diversifying me? Is it presenting me with music that is like music I listen to already, but is a bit different? Is it thinking in a world sense rather than just in a repeat the same pattern sense? So what is a better product? So a better product is broad. It considers the needs of a lot of different people. It is, um, it has many voices collectively feeding into developing this product. It is considerate. It is considerate of you being a human being with different characteristics. It is considerate of how you live your life. It's considerate of who's living your life with you. Um, it's thoughtful. It's equitable. It's giving people a level playing field. So it's by the algorithm that we code and the data that we feed um, AI, it's learning our habits. Um, don't we want to make a world that's better than the one we have already, where bias exists in terms of gender, in terms of ethnicity? Don't we want to give it a fairer, equitable level playing field? We need the product to be profitable. If we are missing half of the world as part of our product release, which is what happened with um, Apple HealthKit. That's a pretty bad situation to be in. What about all the cross-selling that could have occurred had we included women in that initial launch? Like it has to be profitable. So none of this is, is it's all interconnected. None of it is on its own. The better we build products, the better the products are for the users. The more users we have, the more interactions between the users and the product. So AI has a lot of potential. Um, it could be ethical. It can be calling us out that it recognizes. It could be calling out that in a recruitment process, which Amazon has gone through um, a situation where they tried to have um, AI recruiting and it was very gender biased, for example. That's because a lot of um, men were getting hired. So the algorithm was built without the consideration of the data, which already has bias in it, just continuing in the way it always did. So it recognized that if CVs had women or a women's soccer team, or it had references to certain things, they didn't get the job. And then it inferred that men were better for the job. But we didn't intend it to do that. We want people whose skills are better for the job. So we need to be sure that the um, potential of AI is thinking about ethics, that it educates us, that it says, hey, actually I've noticed in your system, the hiring rates are 70% to 30. Um, here's some information that's available to you to consider changing this. Um, and if, if that's at every level, if people are considering that in education, that can again skew, um, away from bias where there might be a bias towards um, boys going towards technology and girls going towards non-technology. And if education is fairly non-biased, then we can improve the stats of people who are available to us in the recruitment industry. Because I think, Barry, you can speak to this, that there aren't equal numbers of candidates available for diversity. Diversity is a difficult thing to deal with. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, um, Barry, on this at the end. Um, it can be inclusive. It can, both in the teams that create it 
and the user to use it, it can include everybody and it can be a snowball of inclusion. So once we start, like, I don't know if you remember when you started recycling and then you were like, hey, I'm great, I'm gonna start recycling. And then you start thinking, oh, is it better if I buy glass than plastic? And maybe you buy more glass than plastic. And then you're like, maybe I can wash this jar and reuse it to plant something in. And we think about reuse. Um, so we're constantly, once we get in the zone of awareness, we just keep improving. Um, seeing Anthony there, he's probably polishing up his talk. <laughs> no, he's ready, he's confident. Um, it can be more resilient. It can be resilient because it's thought of edge cases. It's thought of different groups of people and how they think and how the world looks to them and how they view opportunity. Um, AI can be a role model. It can basically be something that changes us for the better. It can say, no, that comment was not okay. It's not okay to hire unfairly. Um, people with uh, physical um, ability differences need to be treated differently so that they can access the world fairly. The world is the, the reason people have a disability in the sense that it's because it's not built for people in wheelchairs. So that causes them to have a disability. So what's our job in all of this? So we can be accountable, we can become aware, we can see what our teams look like, what they are representing in terms of human characteristics. It can note the bias that exists because of the makeup of our teams and it can, we can actually talk to that bias. We can say we need more diverse um, team members, we need more user research that covers a broader range, we need more diverse data to go into this algorithm to make it fairer. We can think about checks that we can put in our algorithms to uh, enforce a, a fairer voice. Um, and we can grow and we can listen. We can be open to change. We can be open to saying, I didn't think about that before. I neglected that. I'm open to making it better. So we can con continuously grow in the, the world of technology and AI. And it's very possible if we all make changes, they don't have to be huge, they just have to be small and build like the recycling model. Um, we can make a big difference. Um, Maya Angeli said, it is time for parents to teach young people early on that in diversity there is beauty and there is strength. So there's some references there at the end to Rosie the Riveter. Or initially, actually, Rosie the Riveter was a... Um, Norman Rockwell poster that appeared in the front of uh, the Sunday Times. And things back then were much slower moving, so that would have stayed around for quite a long time. Um, facial recognition, there's an article there on racist facial recognition um, and AI failures by uh, Joy on YouTube, if you'd like to take a, a look at that. Her face wasn't rec recognized as a face at all. She's a black woman. And the database of facial recognition is mainly white, so you can see where the problem would lie there. Um, gender bias AI, there's an article that you can read. I'm happy to share these in the chat as well. There's a feminist guide to AI. There's a chatbot that is a, a feminist guide, which just takes you through a conversation, which is kind of pre prescriptive, but um, it's quite helpful. And then there's just an article about um, the health kit and its failure to include women. So that is the end of my talk. Um, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for listening. And I'm looking forward to discussing some of the points with you now. Thanks, Mag, that was brilliant. That was great, really interesting. Um, did, did anyone have any, any direct questions on, on any of the content, any, anything, anything raised there? I tell you, it's it's a hot topic at the moment, isn't it? And it's it's one of these um, one of these areas that's uh, that's so I mean so important to to get out there and 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 I think there can't be too much education uh, around this this kind of thing. Um, and it and it's so so difficult to to find the right way. I, I guess I'm not the only one that's been reading sort of a great deal about all this kind of thing. So yeah, it was interesting to see a member of the community 
you know, of, of the tech community sort of presentation around it. I, I, I love the, the Amazon example um, as well about... Um, Which example? Sorry, Barry. About the Amazon recruitment example. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. About, about AI within that and how, um, yeah, the challenge is that. Um, and the thing is, um, we write algorithms for AI and then we feed it lots of data. So, in fact, um, it's, diff it's more difficult for a coder to decipher where it's introducing this bias from. It's not as straightforward as your sort of more binary coding where you can step through and you can say, oh, this happened, there's an if else, and you know, that's why it occurred. But like this is, it's the data that is biased already. And then we're not putting checks in our algorithms, which it feeds into. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see how it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, yeah. And, um, and this idea, the, the comparison to recycling, I thought that was really, really interesting as well. Cause you, you're right. You know, the second you, you start looking for this, this stuff, you start seeing, seeing more and more of it around and more and more opportunities to, uh, to make a difference. So, yeah. so no, that, that was brilliant. And even here, are there people who have a different language as their first language, for example, it's just a tiny thing. Yeah, do you want to say how that has affected life, like in terms of AI? What's your experience has been? In, in terms of AI? Um, well, I'm, I'm basically in Greek. Um, so, yes, my first language is Greek. Uh, I haven't had really a huge problem, to be honest. <laughs> but, have uh, you had any, have you had use with Siri or Alexa or Cortana? Oh, they, don't, they don't support. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, they, they don't support uh, the Greek language, if, if that's what you mean. Um, <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, maybe I get more from the people, to be honest, uh, sometimes. They do really? The, okay. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's fine. That's just, uh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I don't think it is fine, actually. Um, I think we can do better. In, yeah. In logical terms, not not. Not exaggerating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Gav, you raised your hand. What have you got to say for yourself? Um, hi, Mag. Hi, Barry. Um, no, I, I, even though it's not my first language, I don't have any problems with any AI I've come across so far. That's good. Glad to hear it. And um, we have, I believe, uh, we've got two ladies besides myself on the call. How does it make you feel hearing about Apple HealthKit? Um, I was actually quite surprised. It just seems such an obvious thing to include. So I was shocked. Like I've, I've read that uh, recently, so I should have loved it because I thought it's pretty obvious, but yeah. clearly not. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating to me. What do you think, Imogen? Yeah, I think, um uh I, th I think it's a it's just one of many oversights right like in in these sorts of things you either have to go like looking for it i don't know why it's not more integrated in what the 51 percent right like we're te technically um make up that much of the population you feel like it should be more uh inclusive but there's like, it's just one of so many examples i think yeah um but yeah you hope that uh the likes of apple and um Amazon are maybe more conscious of it, uh, but being being young younger companies, but I don't know. I think it's I think it's evolving. And it'll get there. Yeah. Um, who else would like to weigh in on anything at all that they had in terms of thoughts from our talk today? So uh, I'm working at IBM at the moment, and we've removed all the facial recognition software that we offer. Um, in the last month so that's not being offered to any clients now and next week I've got a hackathon and one of my teams is working on job specs and feeding it job specifications so that we take out all the words that are sort of male biased and I've got like a list that I'm looking at and that's what we're going to feed to it but sometimes we're going to ha we have job specs with things like challenging confident courageous intellect individual headstrong greedy forceful driven dominant and apparently they're all um geared towards men so not that we've got any of those in our job specs but we're going to feed it current mm -hmm. job specs to see 
if they include those words and if they do they should be removed so it's it's going to be a tool to flag words in job specifications it's really interesting would you be uh, open to coming and talking to us about that gav at, at some point in the future maybe uh, could do i could get one of my team to do it possibly yeah that'd be that'd be really interesting no worries would anyone else like to weigh in? I uh, think, so, sorry, hi. Um, the only thing I kind of notice from, from the stuff that I do, um, I work out with, with STEM apps, which is one of the kind of um, uh, coding science groups that works with, with girls. Um, so I'll take my daughter along. Um, that when I talk about it to, to parents, it's quite often that the parents who say, well, actually, no, maybe girls don't want to do science. It's almost getting the parents to actually kind of chime in and say, well, maybe they don't want to do science. Why are you pushing them so hard? It's, it's not that we're pushing them hard. We're just trying to level the playing field out. Um, but they yeah. don't see it that way. They see it. That we're, they're, they're, but they, they, want, they, they want to do nail varnish, you know, or whatever else they think in their heads is, is normal. Um, uh, and, and it's almost the, the parents that I'm aiming for almost um, as the kids, because the, the kids are going to pick it up from the parents. Uh, and if the parents don't see it as an issue, um, then the kids won't either. Um, so I think in terms of growth of the growth of the diversity through the, through the whole industry, um, it's that area that I kind of look at uh, being a parent myself as well. So um, yeah, that's, and that's it's an interesting, um, you know, parallel to AI is the parent feeding the child all of the information and being the role model. Like AI can also be that for us. It's, it's yeah, 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 similar. yeah. Great, Barry. I know you have a schedule to keep, so you may shut me down at any mm -hmm. point. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Then I'll um yeah, we're going to move on to Anthony um, Accioli. So, Mag, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you great, all. I really appreciate you listening. Great presentation. So, um, you, you all actually have Anthony to thank for this in, in more ways than one, um, because it was a discussion over LinkedIn um, between him and myself, April 17th, I think it was, um, where he said, I wonder if some kind of uh, speaker um, workshop would be possible over Zoom, you know, shortly after the lockdown. And that set off a few fireworks in my head that has now become this aspiring speakers group and and women's only faction and all these different things that, that are now going so thank anthony blame anthony do what you will um but he's um he's up next with his presentation so anthony if you're if you're ready to share your screen you're good to go thanks barry and thanks mag uh, let's do the horn honors here can you guys see my screen so this time I'll double check everything. Can you see my console? Okay, can you see my slides? Okay. So last time I did this presentation on Linux and like for about three or four minutes as I was running without slides because people couldn't see it. And now I'm only on Windows and I'm going to use Docker. So God have mercy on my soul or something, but, but let's see. <laughs> Uh, so here you go. The first thing is to set some expectations. Uh, this is going to be somewhat of a larger talk, a bigger talk than I initially intended. So I've decided to split this into two parts. So yes, you, if you want to see the second part, it's going to be in August, okay? So for this first part of the talk, uh, I'm going to uh, speak more about CockroachDB. Uh, although I'm going to just like give you a brief introduction about r 2 uh, so uh, that, that you guys can come back if that's what you're looking for. So about me, I'm a Java developer, uh, 12, been working with Java for about 12 years. Uh, it's been building scalable systems for a while. I work at Ericsson in Telco. I build the second largest uh, marketplace in Brazil after Amazon. I work with building so all industries that require, require 
high scalability. Uh, Maggie was speaking about accents and natural language recognition. I'm from Brazil. I spent two years in Ireland in Atlum and I lived three years in Glasgow. So my accent is all over the place. Uh, Siri may not recognize it, but if you don't, please give me a shout and I'll, I'll repeat for you, okay? I'm now working in finances uh, for, a name, for a company that shall remain unnamed for reasons. It's not like you can just use some website to figure out where I work, right? Uh, opinions here are my own. I'm not, don't, they don't represent my employer. I'm not affiliated with any of the vendors. And basically, I don't know what I'm doing here, so. <laughs> Um, my agenda is what is CockroachDB? Uh, the good and bad use cases for the problems that CockroachDB solves, as well as what is our TubeDBC. And I'm going to show you a little bit of code and tell you why or why you shouldn't use those technologies at the moment, okay? I will open us uh, some time for questions at the end, but feel free to interrupt me if you have questions meanwhile. So what is CockroachDB? CockroachDB is a new SQL database. And new SQL by definition, it means it has the scalability of a NoSQL solution, but it implements a uh, SQL as a language protocol. In this, in CockroachDB's case, it is fully compatible with uh, Postgres. That means that you can use your JGBC driver to connect to it, or if you are on any other language, you just use the tools that you generally use to work with Postgres. It also has full support for ACID transactions. So more than that, is actually serializable by default, which is something that most databases aren't, like MySQL and even Postgre default level serialization mm -hmm. is subject to, to phantom rights and things like that. CockroachDB is a distributed database that, is, that uses serializable isolation level by default. Uh, it uses, as you probably notice already. This means that this is a, a, a DB when, for when you don't want to lose data at all, okay? So that means uh, we are going to tolerate a level of, of, um, of latency of, as a trade-off for being able to, well, be consistent all of the time. Okay, so it works with synchronous replication. That means that it will only acknowledge your commit once uh, replicas have been uh, distributed and every node uh, has, uh, every node involved in a transaction has given its okay, okay. It uses raft consensus uh, to achieve this distribution uh, uh, in a safe manner. Okay. It is also cloud and container friendly. So it, they have their own uh, hosted service that works on, on AWS and also on GCP. Uh, and you can also just run your, a Docker Swarm or a Kubernetes uh, um, cluster. That's what one of my demos today. Um, how it achieves scale. It achieves scale by breaking down your data into ranges, okay? So if you have a table, you have to pay attention to the keys of this table, and it's going to basically distribute those ranges among multiple nodes in your cluster, okay? But contrary to, say, master-master replication, uh, it uses something that the cockroach guys called multi-active availability. 
That means that you can connect to any node in the cluster and this node will find out like the lead, uh, the, the leader uh, of this data if you want to write or is going to forward you your request or if you just want to read. So that means that you get scalability without uh, uh, the hardships of like master-master replication. And other than that, you can lo lose nodes, okay? And as long as you don't lose the minimum amount of nodes required per each one of those ranges, uh, CockroachDB will go on. So it's a very resilient database. If you're really serious about it, if you're building an, a global application on multiple regions and, and you need it to like keep your data into a specific region, but still have failovers, uh, they, it, it also contain, it also implements uh, geographical and archival partitioning. Okay, so I think this is a paid feature. So why would I use uh, CockroachDB? Uh, my main use case for it is when you are, like when data is very important, when you are the authoritative, uh, your system holds the authoritative version of the data. Uh, it is mean for online transaction processes. This is not a system for analytics, okay? Uh, you have Snowflake, Redshift for analytics if you need something like that. It uses SQL, of course, as I already mentioned. It's multi-region, multi-active, so if you need your, your data distrib distributed around the world, that's a good, uh, a good solution. So in com comparison, for instance, uh, I built a system using Aurora uh, six or six or seven months ago, and it, they had just started with Moat Master support for PostgreSQL. Uh, so you have to choose between master slave replication. I don't know if they are renaming it to something better than master slave, or you choose Moat Master. But if you choose Multimaster, you can only have two nodes in one single region. So like you're not going to get scalability out, out of that, okay? Uh, asset transactions like already mentioned. And how, like I mentioned before, since consistency is the, the, primary, uh, the primary goal of the database, uh, you're going to get synchronous replication, you're going to pay uh, for the latency of getting consensus uh, amongst your nodes, okay? If you really need like latency skiing and you are willing to sacrifice, uh, sacrifice consistency, then there are better solutions. You can use something like Cassandra. Cassandra, you can uh, tune up the, the consistency um, uh, parameters and you can say, I only want to, uh, to have one node acknowledge my commit and my commits will be synced only periodic. That means asynchronous commits and it will auto acknowledge after one node says that it wrote whatever it needed to write. So it's going to be fine until it doesn't. So. Um, another thing that you have to keep in mind when using uh, CockroachDB is that although it, it looks, for you, it looks exactly like a relational database, you have to really pay attention to the primary keys that you choose uh, because the ranges of data will be determined by by the primary keys, my, my demo will go into details about that. So if you choose the wrong strategy of primary key, say uh, auto increment kind of thing that we're use, used to, to use with relational databases, then you're going to get a lot of contention because uh, every write will go to the same uh, node, basically, right? Uh, on the other hand, if you, ch you choose 
too much of an, a random key, then your data will be scattered all over the nodes and you're going to have to do scans all, all over those nodes. And full table scans are even more, more deadly in CockroachDB than they are in a relational database. So you really, really, really want to avoid queries with full table scans. Okay, so let's run a demo here. So just to give you some context of how it works. So I've prepared a small cluster uh, of, of cockroach DB nodes. Can you guys uh, see it or is it true? Okay. So three nodes, okay. Uh, running on Docker, I could make it fancier and, and run on Kubernetes, but for development purposes, that's enough. They are also running with an insecure flag, means that no encryption and everyone can connect without a pass, pass, uh, password of any kind. So don't do this in production. And each one of those nodes will wait for the other three nodes. And I will show you how to initialize. It uses Postgre standard uh, ports for connection. And it also has an admin console. So I'm exposing those ports in one of those nodes. I could be exposing the ports on every one of them or none of them. And I could connect my GDBC application or access the admin from any of the nodes. So that's part of the most active uh, architecture of CockroachDB. So I'm just going to run a Docker command here to start our cluster. So it's creating the nodes. All good. Uh, Cockroach isn't running yet because I told them to wait for each other. So I need to issue a command saying init to tell Cockroach that all nodes are, are up and running and that it can start. And here we are, we have the three nodes uh, running. Let's, just so that we can play with it, let's load some, some data. And it created a few tables and inserted some, some, some data. So before I show you uh, anything more advanced, it has an embed SQL client. So you can open the client, show databases. As you see, we have uh, this move VR uh, database that I loaded tables. It has a few tables here. Um, so you can select something from users. Here you go. You have some, some users. Uh, the primary key is actually show create table or show create for users, I think, to create a table for users. Show hmm. create users. Okay, so the primary key is the, the, a combination of the UID and a city. 
So, and this is important because the way that cockroach DB works is by splitting uh, date, uh, replicas of the data between nodes, right? So since our primary key is made up of the CD and uh, UUID, it has been smart enough to figure out that he's going to split users by, by CD, uh, right? And if some of those CDs becomes too huge, it will just split and create new uh, partitions for this specific city. Uh, between our three nodes, uh, each one of them is the lease holder for a specific uh, partition. The lease holder is the write coordinator. Okay, so every time that you write, even if you connect to node one, uh, if the data is on node three, node three will be coordinating the writes. Okay. So that's what I wanted to show uh, from this guy. So let's run a small load here for a few minutes. Sorry. Exit this. So now there's a, a few queries and inserts and, and, and things happening in the background. Um, let me open the admin console. And you can see that we have three nodes online uh, 62 ranges of partitions. It's running a fair amount of 200 queries for per second here. It's not a huge load. Okay. And the kind of things that it's running are updates, lots of selects from specific table. It's a somewhat realistic load. Um, no processing failures uh, since the, the start, no, okay? So everything is running good on our cluster. Let's simulate a scenario where something goes wrong. Okay, so I'll just manually stop one of the three nodes in Docker to simulate something going wrong. So node two has exited. If you look at the admin, it already detected that one of our uh, nodes is suspect of, of not being working at the moment. Loads are still running good. No errors at all whatsoever uh, during the, the failure. Okay. Uh, another thing is, it's smart enough to rearrange the ranges. So, if I go back to that same uh, table. From table users.
now the leaseholder for those rangers are just between node two and one. If I re restart the the node three, it will also rebalance itself again and give some 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 load for the third node. Okay, so let me just take this down. So far, so good. Any questions? Any any doubts? But I'll take silence as as no. Uh, we did have one one question come in, um, Anthony, which was how how does cockroach handle rebalancing when new nodes are added to the cluster? I don't know if that's something better handled after after presentation or. Um, so uh, the that's what like to see. Uh, from this demo, it's automatic. I, I didn't start a new node uh, after I deleted one, but the same thing will happen. Okay, so when you add a new node to the cluster, uh, it's going to uh, run a rebalance algorithm and it will pick up some, first it will make sure that the new cluster node is up to date with the latest versions of everything and then it will uh, start to migrate some of those ranges uh, to, to the new node in a way that it becomes the leaseholder for the nodes. So, and you can even do it in uh, some like auto scale fashion uh, when like, if you have Kubernetes configure or something like that, when you get like a latency of over X or too many queries or something like that, or you scale your Kubernetes cluster, as, as long as like the, the new nodes join the cluster, like CockroachDB will uh, rebalance uh, the load automatically. Uh, there are more advanced things that uh, I can mention. Uh, if you are a database administrator, you can have like different topologies and strategies uh, in order to, to make sure that this all goes nice, but then you, you can ask me at the end of the talk, <laughs> okay? So it's already 1.30. Just a really, really, really quick introduction to what is R2DBC and why I think it's a good a fit for um, for cockroach DB. So R2DBC is a standard API for reactive programming using uh, SQL databases. Okay. When I say standard, keep in mind that there is competition. Okay. Pivotal is the, the, the main company behind uh, R2DBC. It's an open source uh, project. But you do have Vertex, uh, so I think that tonight we're going to have a talk about Quarkus. Quarkus uses Vertex uh, to, uh, as its main uh, reactive library and data for database connectivity. Uh, Hibernate is also implement its own reactive extensions. So this is somewhat new, like uh, standards are still being created. Oracle was working on something as well, and then the project got canceled. So you, you never know what the future is going to be, okay? Uh, R2DBC uses Project Reactor, again, Pivotal. Uh, so basically, if you're familiar with monos and fluxes, like it's going to be very, very familiar for you to use. Uh, but if you are an Rx Java guy, uh, there are projects like Spring Data that also makes it compliant with other data streaming libraries. Okay. Again, same. That Pivotal is the common team here. So Spring Web Flux and uh, works great with it. So if you're doing a REST web service you are starting from a mono or a flux anyway, and you go end to end uh, 
reactive, like with break pressure enabled and everything else. Okay. So that I can give you some taste of the, the next uh, talk. It's really, really easy to get started with it. Uh, it'll just include the dependencies for the driver. There are drivers, sorry. There are drivers for for Postgres, MySQL, H2 database, and a few others, okay? As you can see, it didn't hit 1.0 yet. There are some milestones. Uh, so we're talking about early stage software, but it works, okay? And with the dependencies, you create a connection uh, from from the driver, you can use its pool, uh, which is optional, but if you're going reactive, you probably want a, a pool as well. You're looking for performance, right? And once you have the pool, uh, it looks pretty much like JDBC, but using reactive strings. So if you want to insert something, you create an insert statement and flat map over the connection, bind uh, every one of the variables that you want to bind to the queries. So this is Postgres uh, kind of syntax, like, uh, and execute and off it goes. So uh, you can subscribe this into a multi-threaded scheduler, you can do whatever you want. Uh, the good thing about Postgres is, is even if you are looking for something that is not quite relational, it has great support for the JSON uh, for, for JSON uh, documents, and it works quite well with CockroachDB and with R2DBC as well. So we are not limited to standard uh, relational database stuff. Uh, having said that, uh, fair warning, okay, uh, R2DBC has not reached uh, uh, general availability yet. It's still alpha software, okay. Possibly driver for, post, uh, for R2DBC by consequence is also not uh, general uh, availability software. Uh, if you look at CockroachDB, tools page, it mentions Ibernate, it mentions several tools. It don't mention, it doesn't mention like R2DBC at all, okay? So be warned, it works, but I, I'm not telling to, you to do that in production. Uh, last, my last presentation, I was actually running on Linux and, and pasted a, a image of like a Windows blue screen of bed. People were apparently triggered by that. So now I'm on Windows uh, posting an image of a kernel panic here. So uh, uh, we're going to skip this one. And that's it for, for me. If I know that we're all kind of stuck at home, but for a while, but if you want to pay me a beer, these are my three favorite ones. So one from Scotland, one from Ireland, and one from Brazil. <laughs> Very kind of you to, uh, to make that easy to see, uh, to see which one to pay you with. That's yes. a very diverse range of beer. <laughs> it is. <laughs> hey, thank you, Anthony. That was great. Um, did anyone have any questions? I know we've gone over the hour mark now, but did anyone have any questions on that for Anthony? I, I, I had a question. Um, the, the data type supported seem greatly reduced to standard SQL solutions. So I was wondering if you bumped into any issues in, in using that. So um, I, I'm actually using CockroachDB right now. Yes, we did bump on some things. Uh, not, not that we didn't find the type that we needed, but sometimes, for instance, like uh, I'm using Ibernate with it. And it, we are doing serialization of Avro schemes and some complicated stuff. And for instance, uh, when you use the lob annotation, 
uh, it creates the wrong data data type uh, on on CockroachDB. So you have to change your data type manually. So that was something that happened uh, uh, in my job. Uh, another thing that we missed, but now it's fixed, uh, is that we didn't have select for update. Uh, and but now the latest version introduced it and it's working fine. I have a question and it's about the name of the database. Do we think that is a positive name for making people want to use the database? Because personally, as a hygienic person, I'm like, oh, I don't know, I might just stick with SQL. Uh, I, I honestly don't know what's the story behind the name, but in a way, I think that it, it talks about resilience, you know, like uh, I, I, I think about cockroach surviving even if yes, we die. Yes, okay, know. great. <laughs> Good answer. Yeah, absolutely. Marketing head on that one. Brilliant. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. Um, thanks to, to our two speakers and to everyone that, that joined us. Um, there, Dom Carlo has just put a feedback uh, link in the, uh, in the chat there. Um, we'll, we'll email that to you as well. Um, so if you are happy to give any feedback uh, to the speakers, please do. Um, it's, it's always so, so useful when you're just getting started to know which bits are the good bits and, and if there's any specific areas of development. Um, yeah, and other than that, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoy this idea. And if you are interested in, um, in coming forward, giving a lightning talk or a full talk or anything, then um, yeah, get in touch. See us on LinkedIn and, uh, and, and we'll hook you up. So thanks again, I guys. I would like to nominate uh, Image and Large as uh, if it's that <laughs> kind of uh, community to do a lightning talk. Brilliant. This is, it's on recording now as well. So. <laughs> Yay. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. I want to support you the way you support me. <laughs> <laughs> we should get you on every time, Mag, to kind of pick on someone in the audience each time yeah. and say, right, for the next one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great day and I'll, uh, I'll catch you soon. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.